dollars, a pair of rubbers, and a fella back home. <laughs> How about me taking you out? It's all right with me. We can get rid of the interference. Hello, Johnny. Did you enjoy the Army and Navy game last week, Mildred? No. Army lost, and I bet on them because I fell for a cadet. And after all the years, I've been true to the Navy. <laughs> Billy Weather, you have in these hills. You should be here in midwinter. Why, it gets so cold, we could use frigid airs for toasters. <laughs> Byron and Charlie keep me so on the run, I never mind the cold here. I resent their selfishness in monopolizing your company. Don't be silly, Tim. As my brother Byron's roommate, you're just one of the family. I wonder why Byron wouldn't stay and have tea with us. Oh, you know his moods. He said he had a headache and was going back to the dawn. Oh, yes, yes, I'll call him. Uh, you're wanted on the telephone, Ken. Long distance. Thanks, sir. Pardon me. I'm sure you'll find Professor Bostwick much better company. <laughs> I'm afraid Kenneth is given to gross exaggeration. Uh, Lennon, Professor? Yes, please. Why, Dad, where are you? I came over here to Bannington on business. If you can drive to meet your name with you. All right, I'll meet you at the hotel. Oh, and Dad, it's Paul House Party, you know, and I've got a girl here. Yeah, Byron's sister. You mind if I bring her along? Okay, we'll meet you later. <laughs> Paul is over at Barrington. That's a two-hour ride from here. Would you like to ride over with me, or would you rather stay here for the dance? Oh, the ride, by all means. There'll be a full moon tonight, and it'll be beautiful. Uh, can Miss Case come along? Why, certainly. Uh, if you like riding over rough country roads. I don't. Don't worry. I'd rather touch Jean alone and leave an easy chair for a bumpy automobile seat. I think we'd better start back to the inn. It's getting late. I'm sorry you must leave. Your presence at my bachelor quarters has been a genuine treat. Uh, tell Byron I shall expect you all tomorrow afternoon. That's very good of you, Mr. Byron. I'll tell them. Well, the last minute, so I left her at the inn. <laughs> like a brother. What do you mean by that? Oh, moody and vain. You know, I never liked what little I've seen of him. How do you know his father? Nothing much. He died when Byron and Jean were very young. I don't know what his business was, but he left plenty of money. Money, my boy, has never bought feeding. You know, you've had Byron at your home several times. As far as I know, you've never been asked to visit him. Bye tells me his mother doesn't care much for company. They're all right. Oh, the driver flies over. I'm getting tired and comfortable. We'll soon be there. You can stay up in the dormitory with us as usual. Yes, there is room. Of course there is. Number 29. You go right up and I'll take the car down to the garage. Bye will probably be asleep, but the door's always unlocked.
Dad. Dad. Bye. Byron. What's the matter? Byron killed himself. Killed? What do you mean? How? Look. When did you discover him? Just a minute ago. I couldn't get in my room last night, so I stayed here. We'd better get the doctor. No way. He may still be alive. We'd better get him back into his room. Well, if the door's locked, how can we get in? Oh, I know. I'll climb up the ivy. You go up and wait outside the door. I'll be there in a minute. Dr. Howell, I'll handle this. That's right, Doctor. 29 Stonely Hall. You'll be right over. Get me the end, please. Is Mr. Joseph Harris registered there? Thanks. Dad, why on earth didn't you stay in my room? Well, never mind now and hurry right over. Something terrible has happened. Byron's committed suicide. All right. That's a Bostick, please. You get the doctor? Father and Bossy, too. They're on the way over. How about my sister, Jean? I didn't call her. I think it's best to wait until the doctor's examined her. Why do you think Bai would do such a thing? As far as I know, he had no reason to take his life. Maybe he had reasons you know nothing about. What do you mean? 
Oh, nothing like that. This is most tragic, Professor. Yes, Dr. Howell. I can hardly believe what Kenneth told me. Come in. Where is young Cohen? Tell me all about it if you can, Kenneth. I still can't believe that Byron would take his own life. I hurried as fast as I could. I'm glad you're here, Dad. You remember Father, don't you? Oh, glad to see you, Mr. Harris. I'm sure Kenneth appreciates your help at this moment. This is Charlie Penland, Dad. How do you do, sir? What made you change your mind and stay at the inn last night, Dad? I couldn't get in here because the door was locked. Well, after waiting for 20 minutes for you, I left for the hotel. When did you discover Byron? This morning. I couldn't get in here either last night, so I slept in Charlie's room. Thump of the body against the wall outside awakened me. Did you hear the same noise? No, sir. I didn't even hear Ken come in. I guess I'd been asleep for some time. You must sleep very soundly. Are in your clothes, too? Well, to tell you the truth, sir, I had a few drinks at the dance last night, and I can't be too sure of what I may have heard after that. I was so tired I didn't even bother to undress. Well, in that case, your account of last night would naturally be worthless, but warranting investigation. As you doubtless know, Professor, criminology has always been my hobby, although I'm a corporation lawyer. So I've understood, Mr. Harris. I'm sure your knowledge will be invaluable. Is that the rope by which Byron was hanging? Yes, sir. It's tied in a slip knot. My loosening. Hmm. Strangulation by hanging is a very nasty death for one to choose. Particularly with a rope as heavy and rough as this. What are you getting at, Mr. Harris? The heavier the rope, the more difficult it is for the knot to split. Sometimes it doesn't split at all. However, it's certainly worked in poor Byron's case. And now it's up to us to discover why he chose to hang himself. Gentlemen, Byron Coates did not hang himself. He was dead before the rope was tied about his neck. Sorry to disturb you so early in this case, but I've got to tell you something. Something you'll have to tell Jean. It's about her brother, Byron. He, he's dead. Dead? How awful! When did it happen? The doctor says about midnight. I found him early this morning, hanging from his dormitory window. Then it was suicide? Well, we thought so at first. But the doctor's examination proved he was dead before the rope was tied around his neck. There'll be an autopsy this afternoon, and we'll know more definitely. I'll wire Byron's mother. And you tell Jean. No, I'll handle everything for this end of the family. Mrs. Coates is a helpless person, if ever there was one. I'll phone her and follow what instructions she may give. This is a terrible situation. You think it's murder, don't you? Well, let's not say that yet until we really know. Well, it's obvious the person can't die and then hang himself later. There's liable to be considerable excitement here today. So Professor Bostwick has offered to give us our meals at his house so we won't be annoyed by outsiders. You tell Jean and I'll call for you at lunchtime. That's kind of the professor. We'll expect you at once. I'll go up now and wake Jean. She slept quite long enough. If she came in when she said she was going to. Why, I didn't know she went out last night. She told me she had a cold and was going right to bed. I don't know anything about that. She suddenly decided she was going to walk over and see her brother and be back within an hour. Now, let's get all the facts straight. After you drop me in front of your dormitory, put the car in the garage. That's right. And you stopped for a sandwich at the campus grill. Yes, and from there I came right here and couldn't get in. Come in. I just heard the news. Gee, I'm terribly sorry. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Harris. That's all right, Bill. I was just leaving. I think I'll go downstairs and have another little chat with Charlie Pendleton. And I'll meet you later at Professor Bostwick. Isn't there anything I can possibly do? Poor old Bye. He was a swell fellow. Yeah, he certainly was, Bill. Well roommate, too. I can hardly realize it. Why, I only saw it by and spoke to him at 11 o'clock last night. You did? Where? Why, right here. I leaned out my window and asked him to go eat with me. 
He leaned out and said he was half undressed and was going to bed. Well, I fooled around a while, and then I heard your door open and close. I thought, of course, it was you. So I went to the window and yelled a second time for you. I looked out and said you weren't in. So I asked him if he was walking in asleep. He said no, he had a visitor. And he laughed and said good night. Bill, that visitor might have been Bai's murderer. Gee, I never thought of that. Was Bai in pajamas the second time he came to the window? Yeah, and a gray bathrobe, too. I saw the stripes on the collar of his pajamas. Stripes? Sure, why? Well, he had on plain blue ones when I found him this morning. No striped pajamas here. Now that you mention it, I distinctly remember Bob had been wearing a striped pair the past few nights. This is the robe I saw him wearing, Ken. Funny you should hang it up. Look. Blood. He must have cut himself shaving. You don't cut the back of your neck when you shave, Bill. Let's come tell your story to my dad before the local police get in and gum up everything. I've seen the president of the college. He's waiting for the coroner's report and the sheriff's instructions. He says that the verdict agrees with what we think. He's going to conduct a meeting tonight and announce his entire student body. A very sensible procedure. If students got no news except from these papers, it would make a terrible mess of things. But that, Bill Smart has just told me something which may be of great importance. Fine, Bill. What is it? Well, sir, I talked to Byron twice last night. Once at 11 and again a half hour later. Which time he had a visitor. I thought, of course, it was Ken. Yes. I'm in the lobby, Jean. You and Miss Case are to go to Professor Bostwick's with me. Fine. Hello, Sam. Came over here looking for Ken. I'm going to see Ken in a few minutes over at Bossy's house. Why not come along? Well, I can. I got choir rehearsal in five minutes. I might tell Ken this. I heard someone go into their rooms last night around 11 out my door to see who it was. Well, who was it? I would rather wait and tell that to Ken and the proper authority. Listen, tell Ken to meet me right after choir rehearsal. All right, Sam. I'll see you later, Charles. Come on. Who was that boy you were speaking to just now? Sam Anderson, a classmate of ours. He has some important information concerning Bai's action last night. Huh. Seems to me everyone has a finger in this pie, except the police. You're wrong, Miss Case. I understand the sheriff and his men have been on the case all morning. That's all I know, except that I met Sam Anderson at the inn a short time ago, and he wants to see you after choir rehearsal. Sam says he knows who Bai's visitor was last night. Wouldn't he tell you who it was? No. He said you or the police would get that information. And don't fail to see that boy, Ken. It's most important. They've all heard Ken's and Bill's story of the mysterious visit in Byron's room, and the missing pajama of Kingery. We've also told our individual stories of where we were last evening at the proposed time of Byron's death. Along with you, Miss Cruz. We were supposed to retire at about 9 o'clock because it's cold. Can you kindly explain how it was I saw you enter the hotel as I was registering about 2 o'clock this morning? I, I'm sure you're wrong. I was in bed hours before that. I'll vouch for what Miss Coates has said. She's not in the habit of wandering about strange hotels at such an hour. I'm very sorry to say one of us is lying. I assure you it isn't I. Dr. Howell is calling you, sir. Oh, pardon me. Hello. Harry speaking. All right, goodbye. The autopsy has just been completed. Byron was killed by a small, sharp instrument piercing the brain just under the back of the skull. We're now removing that instrument. I think she and I will retire if you have no objection.
and women of the college. It is not the custom to use the auditorium for an announcement of the type and nature that I have eaten. But something has happened of such importance that tradition must be dropped. One of your classmates last night met his death in a dormitory. Of course, I cannot go into details at this moment, but this I can certainly say, that indisputable evidence points to the fact that the boy, Byron Coates, was murdered. <laughs> Murder is a terrible thing. Particularly terrible when it is found in a college where youth and the highest ideals are supposed to prevail. This tragedy will naturally attract unwelcome publicity to the college. But Cornwall, I can certainly say, will hide nothing. And I request that each and any of you will come forward and tell the proper authorities all that you know relevant to this case. Right. I who that is? It's Sam Anderson, the fellow who was going to tell us about Byron's visitor last night. This boy's been murdered so that he couldn't talk. Some of you boys lift him up and carry him into that side room. Poor Anderson was killed in exactly the same manner as Byron. Naturally proving both crimes were committed by one person. Professor Bostwick, have you questioned the members of your choir as I requested? I've talked to the six boys who stood closest to Anderson. Their individual stories are valueless, each one knowing nothing but the sensation of seeing Anderson fall. No motive, no clue. Well, no, just as I expected. As you both know, I went to the morgue with a body, and while there, I met the sheriff. He asked me to help him in these cases. I merely mentioned it, so that you'll not misjudge my questioning you. You really think Anderson was killed because of what he might have disclosed? There can be no other motive. Ken, have you a flashlight in your car? Oh, yes. Listen, I think I'll accept the invitation you sent me a while ago to stay in your house. In time, I wonder if you could lend me the key to the auditorium. I presume his organ is to have it? Why, yes, of course. Here it is. Only if you're going there tonight, I'm afraid you'll find the place rather eerie. Kenneth, I think, knows where the switches are. Thank you. We'll be back later. Is there a way for me to get into the back of the organ? Yes, there's an entrance for me the side of the pipe. Dad, don't you want me to go with you? No, I'd rather you wouldn't. I have a theory I think I can work out better alone. You go back to your room and I'll be there in a few minutes. Then you can drive me back to Professor Boston. Following. We head to the first town north. We're chasing a fort that has a long start on it. 
After we left the auditorium, I started up the stairs of the choir loft. I immediately heard the slight sound of someone else moving about them. We've lost the trail. Well, what do we do now? Well, we go back to the auditorium, and this time you're going in with me. And we're in luck. You know what that is? Why, it's a needle. Hey, maybe it's the murder instrument. Or the brother to it. Come on, let's get out of here and try to prove our theory. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Harris. Glad you're here. The sheriff left a while ago for your son's room in the dormitory. And I suppose you have something to report or show me. I have. The autopsy of the second body has been completed. The result was identical to that of the first autopsy. Each man was instantly killed by a violent piercing of the brain at the base of the skull. In the brain of each body, we found one of these. Well, they're exactly alike. Tell me this, Doctor. Did I, with a force of my bare hand, skillfully aim and plunge one of these needles into a skull with fatal results? I doubt it. It might be possible, but not probable. Well, then your theory is... I'm not theorizing. This needle was so deeply embedded in the brain, we had to cut away bone to extract it. The very force of its entry proves that it was shot in. What sort of an instrument fire such a thing? I haven't the remotest idea. I'll keep these until the inquest tomorrow morning at 10. You'll be there? Certainly. Good night, Doctor. has retained you to take charge of the investigation of the two murders. Only unofficially. Now, nothing's been said about the second death. Well, that's a small matter. Saw one, then you saw the other. Oh, I'm not so sure about that. I don't understand you, Mr. Harris. I'm just a country sheriff with a hardware business as a sideline. I don't know much about the murder mystery, except what I've seen in the movies. And I'm not ashamed to admit that me and my men are a little over our head in this thing. What do you mean, Sheriff? Well, I hope you won't be offended, Mr. Harris, but I suggested to the president of the college this afternoon that we call in several police detectives from the city. As the official representative of the county, that's naturally your privilege. Oh, now, hold on, Mr. Harris. The president said that you were a mighty clever man, and that for the time being, he preferred your method to that of the city police. Now, Arthur and me here are willing to help you, of course, we're not the smartest sleuths in the world, <laughs> are we, Barker? We've never had a chance to find out up until now. No one around here does worse than break traffic laws. He's a wise man who knows his own limitations. I don't aim to be no blundering backcountry sheriff, the kind they have in mystery stories. About all I can offer you is guns and manpower. Well, I know we're going to work together perfectly. I, too, have read detective stories. As a matter of fact, I've written several of them, but I've always sworn that I'd never be an amateur book detective. You no, know, I've never smoked opium or played the violin. I know no one connected with Scotland Yard and nothing about the French secret police. I've never owned a magnifying glass and I've never worn rubber heels. <laughs> okay. Tell me, any suspects? Well, not at the moment. Have you? We have a couple of ideas. Well, Mark is right, but our theory concerns the second murder. Doc Howell says that those Needles were fired into the brain by some sort of a gun. Now, no one ever heard any shots, did they? Well, go on. Well, compressed air shoots things, doesn't it? And when we think of compressed air, we've got to think about that organ, which is full of it. Now, I ain't mechanically minded, but it's possible that a certain contraption could be hooked to one of the pipes of that organ, so that when a certain note on that organ was struck, it would release and shoot one of those needles. Who was at the keyboard of the organ? 
by Professor Rusty, of course. Professor Rusty, do you mind sitting in the exact position you were in just before Alison was killed? Certainly not. Show your hands right on the keyboard, know your seat in the pedals. I'm positive. You see, I was preoccupied listening to the president's speech, staring at the music before me. Although I sat at the organ, I saw no more than they did. Well, thank you, Professor. Well, I'm afraid that eliminates the sheriff's theory. I understand completely. I wish I could be of more help. with you alone, Jean, since I'm... With Don't, Ken. I know how you feel. I certainly had a friend in you. And so have you, dear. I want you to let me help you. Not only for Byron's sake, but for your own. Well, I know it's no time to talk about what I'd like to no, say. No, don't say it, Ken. At least not now. But if it'll help any, I... I feel the same way. Father will be here in a few moments. Huh? I knew it. More third degree. Oh, he'll be very important, of course, but not overbearing. Miss Case and I have been making all sorts of wild guesses about poor Brian and that Anderson boy. You see, I wasn't there, and no one has really told me about anything that's happened yet. Why, weren't you there, Miss Case? I thought I saw you when I came in. Yes, I was. But I sat so far to the side, I couldn't see a thing. Father, now. Yes? Jean, may I see you for a few minutes? Why, of course. Jean, I want you to talk to me about Byron, just so I never met the boy. Tell me about his habits, his friends, his home life. Our home life has always been very pleasant. Due mostly, of course, to the adoration we had for our mother. Fry and I were great companions. You see, Father died when we were awfully small. My only remembrance of him is of rubbing my cheek against someone with a face that scratched. Have you any photographs of him? Several. Mother still keeps a huge album in the living room. It's a scrapbook habit from the stage, I guess. Oh. Was your mother an actress? She used to be. And a good one, too. She left the stage when Byron was born. But she was quite a famous concert singer and broad. In fact, it was in Paris that she met Father. At least that was where they were married. But have you any remembrance of living elsewhere in Boston? Oh, my, yes. We traveled extensively. Until ten years ago when Mother felt we should settle down. So she bought an old house in the most sedate part of Boston. It's a nice house, but a lonely one. Lonely? Why? Well... Mother isn't Boston, if you know what I mean. But can you tell me the financial condition of your family? Oh, there's plenty of money. But as I understand it, the greater part of it is held in trust for Byron and Jean. Particularly for Byron. Yes, sister. I never knew that. Well, that means, of course, that Byron would have inherited a considerable estate from coming of age. How old was he? Why, today was his birthday. He would have been 21. You're right, Miss Case. I forgot all about it. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're getting someplace now. Byron's murder was planned and timed perfectly. Just a few hours before he received word of his inheritance. Somebody wanted that money for... Mr. Tapp, are you insinuating that Jean... I'm only insinuating that the murder was committed for the reason that most crimes are, for money. Coming of age, Byron probably received word of his inheritance. Now, Ken, you ought to know something about his nails. Did you ever mention receiving such a letter? No. Although he did receive mail the day before he died. Then we'd have to go through his mail and find out for ourselves. Just a moment. I am probably betraying a confidence, but if it would clear up this point, here is a wire which I received from Byron's mother a few hours ago. You may read it and do as you wish. I don't want to be involved any more than I am. My 
My dear, I'll thank you for this later. Come on, Ken, we're going to your room as fast as we can. Oh, but, Dad, I want to talk to Jean. Later, later, come on, quick. Let Byron keep his mail. That's that. There's nothing here. Add someone's rifle this dead. Why, these drawers were filled with buys mail. I want to tell you how sorry I was about Myron. I know he never liked me, but I liked him. It's horrible to think that he was gone. Well, thanks for feeling that way, John. This is my father. Father, this is John Meserov. How do you do, sir? Pardon my staring at you like this. Your resemblance to Brian Coates is positively shocking. Yes, I, I know that, sir. It's a weird feeling being the living image of a dead man. You, of course, are not related to him. Oh, no, sir. I, I belong to a French family living some few miles from here. If you'll pardon me, I shall say good night. I want to extend my condolences. Well, thanks again, John. Ken, what do you know about that boy? Nothing much, Dad. He's in the junior class and the son of a Frenchman who runs a roadhouse near here. He's not generally liked, and Byron was particularly antagonistic toward him because of their resemblance. By used to say, he rather enjoyed his own face and didn't care to see it spread around. Ken, jealousy is often the motive for crime. You surely don't believe that Mesero would kill by because of their resemblance, do you? Why, they had nothing in common but appearance. Why, my boy? Somehow I feel that this resemblance has a deeper bearing in the case than we know. However, I shall investigate him in the morning after the inquest. In the meantime, there's something I want you to do. What? Byron's body's going to Boston in the morning. And you're going with us. Oh, Dad, I don't want to do that. You do as I tell you. The sheriff and I are perfectly capable of taking care of things here. And I need someone to interview Byron's most interesting mother. But Jean and Miss Kate should do that, not me. Mm. You're wrong, my boy. I'm speaking here for a purpose. If things as they should be, Byron's mother will consider that her last letter ought to be the week she died. And I want you to make her keep that thought until we find out what she wrote it. You're Kenneth Harris, aren't you? Yes. Sir, this is Coates. Byron described you so often, I feel that I know you. Oh, Byron. Please tell me. Where is he? At Waterman's funeral room, downtown. I can't see him. I couldn't stand that. I'm going to try not to be sentimental. I know you share my grief, and I want you to tell me all about it. You see, they wouldn't let me see the papers, and I know nothing except what the police told me over the telephone. I found Byron hanging outside the window by the rope that's used in the fire escape. Oh, oh terrible. Did, did Jean see him? No, we thought it best not to. Darling, now that he's gone, I can only remember him as a child. Have you ever seen his photo? Will you bring me that album over there, please?
Thank you. I want you to know Byron, as I shall always do. These were taken when he was three years old, full of life and play. Here he is, the day after his first haircut. The day he lost his baby curls and became a little man. There he is, a young man entering college. My boy, your roommate. Oh, and to think that I killed him. No, Mrs. Coates, you're not to blame at all. Oh, yes, I am. You don't know. You haven't any idea. But you're mistaken. I have. Then he showed you my last letter. His birthday letter. No. Should he have shown it to me? No. I should never have written it. But I thought he was a man now and could understand. And forgive. Mrs. Coates, I was very close to Byron. Perhaps if you told me what that letter contained, I'd know how it affected him. No, no. That letter has been destroyed now. I wired that it should be sent. I've got to tell you something, Mrs. Coates. Miss Case tried to honor your telegram, but there was no letter to be found. The desk was broken into the night your wire arrived. Who took it? Tell me that. Who took it? We don't know, but we wish we did. Now, Mrs. Coates, please don't get upset. But Byron did not kill him. He was murdered. <gasps> and the murderer wanted your letter. You did a clever bit of work in unearthing this contraption from the college grounds. Wasn't a bad bit of sleuthing, if I do say so myself. I also found out it belonged to Professor Brand. I had Barker tell him to come up here. Come in. Gentlemen, Professor Brand, can you identify this peculiar weapon? Why, this is a new invention used in the killing of cattle. The Western Packing House sent it to me for exhibition purposes in my economics class. All very interesting, Professor. But explain how I found this thing buried in the campus near the auditorium. That I can't answer, sir. I've been in New York over this past weekend. I returned today only because of these tragic deaths. Now, don't worry, Professor. Our question is only to determine who used that gun in your absence. Of course, you read in the papers that these boys were murdered through the penetration of steel needles in their skulls. Yes, I did. The cause of my present anxiety. You see, this gun is the most uncommon instrument. And to my knowledge, the only one within miles of here that could have shot those needles. Did you ever shoot that gun yourself? Yes. Into the woodwork of my classroom for demonstration purposes. You see, the packing house included three needles as ammunition for the gun. Two of the needles were found in the bodies. Is this the third? Why, yes, I believe it is. I'm positive. Say, where did you get that needle? 
You've been holding out on the law. Yeah, never mind, never mind. I'll explain that later. Now, Professor, there's only one more question. Can you explain how that gun was taken from your possession? I can. Perhaps I made a serious mistake, but... Byron Cody saw me demonstrate the gun in my economics class. After the lecture, he asked to borrow it over the weekend. Oh, he's a level-headed student. I granted his request with no other thought in mind than that he wanted it for further study. Byron has a gun, eh? Pardon me, Professor. You have to keep the gun as material evidence. Past Professor Brand in the hallway. What are you doing here, Dad? He was identifying his murder weapon. Makes the first part of my case almost complete. Oh. Tell me about your trip to Boston. Well, there isn't very much to tell. The trip was a flop as far as getting information was concerned. Well, what about that letter? I couldn't find out what was in that letter. But she did show me some very interesting photographs. It's unfortunate you couldn't learn the contents of that letter. It undoubtedly contains some very startling news. Besides inheritance facts. Whatever that news was, it probably instilled a sort of suicide in Byron's mind. This unique and silent weapon was demonstrated while he was in his mood. He obtained it and kept it in his room to the night of his death. And he professed to have a headache in order to have privacy. He was interrupted by the arrival of an unknown visitor whom Sam Anderson claimed was here. Whoever this unknown visitor was, he both saw and used the opportunity to kill Byron with the very weapon that Byron himself produced. That's a right smart theory, but what about the second murder? Where does it come in? And why was Byron hanging outside his window? Where are the pajamas he wore? The second murder was a murder of necessity to cover the first. Hanging with an amateur shepherd to proclaim the supposed suicide. John was removed because of blood stains. And these are easy questions, my friend. The difficult one is, who was the murderer? Well, I'm going to clean up before we go over to Bossy's stand. Professor Bosrick was called away to Holyoke for an organ recital. He won't be back until tomorrow for the inquest. Well, we'll go over there anyway. Why should we go to Bossy's if he won't be back till tomorrow? Why, Ken, isn't that the dressing robe that Byron had on when he died? Well, I can't put it on without thinking. Why, it's a letter to Byron from his mother. It's the one we're looking for. I'm the law here. Give me that letter. But I represent the university. Now, wait a minute. Remember, Miss Coates wanted this letter destroyed, unread. I'll prevent that. I demand it as evidence. Have it in due time. I understand your feelings, Ken. You take the letter to Jean. You should read it for us. Your mother's letter to Byron has just been found. We decided you should be the first to read it because of its evident personal content. You, of course, realize that I was instructed to destroy that letter, do you not? There's nothing to stop me from still doing so. Your obligation to justice will stop you. Suppose you take this from the living room and read it, and we'll wait for you here. Well, I think it's merely a family skeleton. If so, I ask the right to tear it up. But if it has any positive bearing on Byron's death, I'll give it back to you, and you may read it to everyone here. This is a funny murder case. You and me are the law, but we don't get no evidence or clues until everybody else is through with them. Yeah, and I don't like it. You will have to assume the responsibility for this. Of course. Gene. I don't want to know what's in that letter under any circumstances. So I'm going to take a walk on the campus until the whole thing's over.
I'll be all right in a moment. Did you catch him? The sheriff and the deputy are after you. See him at all? No, he came in to get the letter. But I think I fooled him. Now, Jean, tell us just what happened. I was sitting in this chair with my back toward the door as I started to read the letter. I read the first page when I thought I heard a faint noise behind me. We'll take no more chances. You read it aloud, Ken, and at once. Dearest Byron, happy birthday. You are now 21. That not only means that you are a man, but a wealthy one. The Boston Bank waiting for you is an inheritance from your father. Your share is over half a million dollars. I guess we should have stayed with the sheriff's car on the main road. But I've got a hunch that this will lead us to something more than a pasture. This is the river road we're on, Charlie. You know, the one that leads to the old deserted road house? We'll stop here. That place is just around the curve. Look, there's a light in there. Nobody's lived in that place for over a hundred years. Bill, that must be the fellow. I'll stay here. You go back and get the sheriff and the rest of them. If anybody tries to leave that house, they'll find it unhealthy. I'll make it as quick as I can. Okay. So now, Byron, you know for the first time that you have a half-brother, John Shaw. He would be a year older than you are now. And although I naturally haven't seen him since he was placed for adoption with a French family by the name of Mesereau 15 years ago, please understand, Byron, dear, that you and Jean have my complete love. I've forgotten John as I forgot Joe, his father, who deserted me many years ago when I learned my marriage to him had been faked and illegal. At the time that I married your father, he accepted and loved John to an extent that made him legally adopt him. Then, as you know, Father died soon after the birth of Jean in Paris. The reading of his will disclosed that he left John an equal third of the fortune you and Jean were to share. That is why I paid the Mesro family to take John, hoping his identity would become lost and his share in the will forgotten. Poor mother, making blunder after blunder in her effort to do right. Byron, you will help me rather than misunderstand, won't you? You will still call me your ever-loving mother. Your mother always was most illogical. Showing favoritism towards children is a bad habit. As far as I could hear from the letters, she had no reason to be ashamed of your half-brother. Take that John Mesereau is Bai's brother after all. And how Bai disliked him. That letter completes the missing part of my theory, Ken. Young Mesereau was undoubtedly guilty of both crimes. In some way, he found out the contents of his stepfather's will and determined not only to have his share, but Byron's, and even possibly Jean's. But how could he have learned of the will, Mr. Hall? Well, it's very simple. Byron read the letter and blurted out the news to Mesro at his first opportunity. That opportunity being when Mesro came to see him the night he was killed. Stop! Who? We don't know who he is. But the fellow we followed is in the old roadhouse on the river road. Come on! I'm going to. No, you mustn't, Jane. No, You're you quite right, Kenneth. He's had enough excitement for one night. Yes, darling, you stay here. We lost him. We found him, Sheriff. Where? He's in the old deserted house on the river road. No!
going up there, Mr. You up there. This is the law speaking. I'm giving you a final chance. We've got you surrounded. Better come down peacefully. Maybe this will convince you that we mean business. I guess we'll have to count those stairs. Parker and I will leave. Great. I'll call him by name. John Mithro. John Shaw. Throw your gun on the floor and raise your hand. Murder of Byron Cook. No. No, I didn't kill him. You can't accuse me of that. Then I arrest you for the murder of Sam Anderson. Yes. Yes, I did kill Anderson. I had to. But I didn't kill Byron. He, he was my brother. And who did it, Miss Rowe? Tell me. No. Don't shoot. Hell, it was... Which one of you fools killed this boy? I have no gun. Speak up. One of you shot him just as he was about to tell the name of Byron Coates' murder. Break those guns open. There was only two shots fired from all these guns. Not counting the one which killed Mesro. The guns don't show nothing, but this is the third killing that's happened in three days. And this one was done for the same reason that the second one was. To keep somebody's mouth shut. Sheriff, John Mesro was not killed by anybody in this room. He was shot in the back by a bullet fired from up above. Come on, Barker. It's our turn to do the shooting. Go that way, Barker. I'll go in here. Well, now that I've gotten Sheen off the bed, what is it you want to talk to me about? About father. Miss Kate. When I was in Boston, I discovered Father's picture in Mrs. Coates' album. It was an old one, taken in Paris. It was signed Joe. And I remember she said in a letter to Byron that Joe was the name of the man who kicked her into marriage and then deserted her. Heaven, boy, you can't think that well, your father... What else father... can I think? Why would his picture be in her album? There's only one way to prove your fear. We must get Mrs. Coates up here to face him at once. That's just what I'm going to do. I'm going to start for Boston right now, and if it's humanly possible, bring Mrs. Coates back here tomorrow. You're a brave boy, Kenneth, and good luck, or rather, bad luck to our suspicions. Ah, Miss Case, you're just the person I want to see. Come, 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 Mr. Harris, more questioning. No, no, not exactly. I want you to send it to Mrs. Coates immediately. That's a coincidence. Kenneth has just left for Boston to get her. Oh, fine. I wish she holds the speed of the entire mystery. Good night. Mother! Why didn't you tell me you were coming? Oh, my dear girl, I should have been with you all through this. Oh. Your father was in the dining room when we had breakfast. He should be here any minute. Here he comes now. 
Well, young man, it's about time you showed up. Dad, I want you to meet Byron's mother, Mrs. Coates. How do you do? Mrs. Coates? Why'd you scare so? Well, I'm sure we've met before. I don't think so. So we should have, with Byron and Kenneth rooming together for so long. You... You seem to fit in the past. I have it. You've had it. Great heavens, Lucy Foreman, the concert singer. It goes to Paris. Don't you remember me? I was a student, and a mutual friend brought me to your dressing room. We had supper that evening, and the next day we went driving. And you lost the heel getting out of the carriage. <laughs> Joe Harris? Yes? Why, of course, now I remember. <laughs> you know I still have a picture of you somewhere at home. No. What a coincidence, meeting like this. We must have a long talk later on. Will you come upstairs with me, dear? Of course, Miss Chase and I will help you, Mother. We'll see you at Professor Bartlett's. I certainly am sorry that I had to be away while all this excitement you were speaking of took place. Poor young Miss Ray. This is the third life so cruelly taken. Good afternoon. Are the others here? Oh, yes. That's Professor Bostrick. He's back from Holyoke, too. Thank you. Mrs. Coates, I want you to meet you. Joe. Oh. Neil. Just a minute, Mr. Shaw. What do you mean, Shaw? That's Professor Barswick. That man is John Methodo's father. Joe Shaw. The man whom I thought I was married to. Sheriff, I demand you hold this man for the murder of Byron Coates and John Methodo, and as accessory in the murder of Sam Anderson. You're darn tootin', I will. But I, I don't know what you're talking about. John Methodo committed all the crimes you accused me of. And why did you kill him? I'll tell you. Killed Byron Coates so that your own son. Sam Anderson saw you leave the scene of the crime and you forced John to murder him. Unfortunately for John, he was about to disclose your guilt. He was a third victim. The murder of your own son killed the chances of your ever getting your hands on the Coates inheritance. If John had lived, he'd probably been your next and last victim. Wait a minute. You're a very clever man, Mr. Harris. But if Lucille hadn't recognized me, your case against me wouldn't be worth a copper. Oh, on the contrary, my dear professor, it'd be worth all the copper in the electric chair. You see, I interviewed the Mesros yesterday and discovered your identity as John's father for myself. Hello, Jean. I don't know how I'm ever going to thank you for all you've done, Mr. Harris. Well, it's Ken who deserves most of your thanks. I did what I could through my interest in criminology and the reputation of the college. Now it's all over, there's something I want to ask you. It's still a mystery to me. Yes? Where were you the night Byron was killed? You told Ken you were going to bed. I saw you into this lobby at 2 o'clock in the morning. I, I'm sorry I lied about that. You see, I did it to save someone's feelings. Who do you mean? Charlie Penland. I broke a secret engagement to him because, well, I liked someone else. As no one but ourselves were involved, I lied to Ken so that I could meet Charlie and tell him how I felt. Well, my dear, love affairs and murder mysteries are not strangers by any means. But who's the lucky man? Ah. Here comes Ken. Don't mention what I told you. Oh, no, 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 I shan't. He's detected enough to find out for himself what he should know. Hello, Dad, Jane. Well, things are very quiet on the campus. There hasn't been a crime all day. Well, Jean is guilty of a very common crime. I'm going to let you solve it. Jean, before I find out what you're guilty of, let me make a confession. Now, wait, Ken. Let's not get all confused. Tell me what you wanted to say the other day. The other day? Oh, yeah, I remember. 